now today we are going to continue with the function chapter. Uh, we have left it off uh, here before 19.3. And we have discussed uh, actually about the, the very first um, things about functions, like when we should write a function and how we should name it and stuff like that. So now we're going to see more things about it. And to begin uh, uh, today's sessions, session, we are starting with the, the fact that functions are for humans and computers as well. And this means that we should be careful uh, when naming uh, functions. So uh, we should uh, aim for the name of the function uh, to be short and also clearly evoke, clearly uh, state what the function does, which is usually hard. And um, we are advised to give um, uh, function names, uh, to, to use verbs as function names, and their arguments uh, to, and for their arguments to use nouns. Now, for example, um, here, uh, no, I mean, actually it says that uh, there are some exceptions. So nouns are okay, the function computer, computer very well, known thing, for example, meme, which is the Bazaar uh, function to compute the meme of something. It's not a, a, a verb, but it's obvious what it does. And actually, as it says, it's better than compute mean, which is longer, and there's no reason to be uh, that explicit about it. And um, yeah, again, with the coefficient, the same. So, as it states here, the, the book says that a good sign that a noun might be better choice is if you're using a, a very broad verb like get, compute, uh, calculate, and blah, blah, blah. Um, it might mean that you can avoid uh, using the verb and just use the noun instead. Uh, and here we have uh, some examples of um, function names. So, F here, it's too short and it's not indicative of what it does at all. Um, my awesome function, uh, it's not a verb and it's pretty long, not descriptive uh, at all of what it does. And here we have some good examples. So for example, in cute missing and collapse years, which they're long, but they're quite clear at least. Um, so here we have some tips for naming. So when we have a name of the function that is composed of multiple words, we can use the snake case, let's say, uh, naming type. That is, we have uh, uh, one word, um, lower, uh, oh, what's that called? Um, uh, slash? No, uh, this is the, the vertical one. Um, uh, underscore? Underscore, yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, underscore and then the other word, or use the camel case naming type that is, uh, you know, separating words by having the first uh, letter of the, of the word as capital. Capitalize every new word of the name. Oh, here I had the underscore. Too. Great. Um, and of course, it doesn't matter which one we pick. As long as we're consistent, that's the the point. Even though even R itself is not consistent, but you know, at least when making our own functions, we can try to be more consistent. Um, oh, also a good tip is to have function families. So functions that do similar things um, is a good idea to start with the similar um, word. Uh, or rather a prefix. For example, um, uh, string, the string R package has this uh, prefix and it's very easy to find the particular function of the package that you need. As long as you type uh, str underscore, you'll get suggestions by R automatically and you can pick the one that you're looking for. Um, Yes, and also it's better to have a common prefix than a suffix for the reason I just said, because autocomplete 
uh, it works only for prefixes, not for suffixes. And yeah, this is a good example. This is not a good example. Um, another tip is also to avoid, um, uh, I mean, you can do it, uh, but it, it's it's better to avoid to um, make, uh, to name functions that are already existent in Bazaar or other packages that you're using. So for example, don't have a new function named meme because this will overwrite the, um, the Bazaar function and the same for the other examples. Um, when writing a function, it's a good idea to have also comments uh, to explain why the code does what it does and um, yeah, uh, why this approach is chosen instead of an alternative. What else did you try? Did it work? You can have such comments as well, but it's better to avoid comments that explain what or how, because this, um, this means that something is not good with the writing the code. Uh, you should be able usually to, uh, to understand what the code does just by reading it. Uh, so yeah. Uh, yes, and here a famous computer science quote is that the only two hards in computer science are cast and validation and naming things. Uh, the first one is indeed a very hard thing to do. The second one sounds not that hard, but in the end, it is. So yeah, here we have the takeaway messages from this uh, subsection, which was rather easy. Uh, just to be consistent with naming and coding of functions, uh, use verbs when yeah, we can, and arguments and the argument and name the arguments using nouns. Um, be consistent with snake case or camel case, and also prefer to use a prefix that is common for a family, let's say, of functions, uh, and avoid overriding existing functions. Okay, and comments, yeah, use comments to explain why uh, about your code, and also a good idea is to use lines of um, uh, uh, of um, uh, la, 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 of uh, what is called or of equals or the other thing the not the underscore the score I don't know. Uh, to break code into our code intersections just to be more easy to read through okay and with this said we can jump in the 19.4 about conditional execution um any comments or something that was not clear until now uh no no i think i'm i'm following clearly thanks okay nice so now about uh conditional execution as i said uh, which is basically if uh statements um these allows us to have conditionally uh execute to 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 execute code conditionally and how we write uh, conditional statements in our we have if, then we have parentheses where we put the condition, and we have curly brackets following right after if in the same line, I mean. Uh, but then we have to change line to write the code that is executed. Also note here that uh, our code after if should be always intended. Um, as we are advised later, it's better to have like two spaces um, to, yeah, to have our code indented by two spaces after completing what the if does. And then we can also have an, an else. So if the condition here is not satisfied, what the code should do. Um, it's important that the curly bracket from here closes right before else. Then we have else again, opening a curly bracket. On the um, on the next line, we have the code executed when the condition is false. Uh, again, indented by two spaces, and then the the end of the um, that the close in curly bracket should be on its own 
on the last line of the of the code chunk. Um, here, um, the the book reminds us that we can use we can call help for if, uh, but usually, uh, not usually. Well, uh, some of the base R functions have not great. Uh, the, the error messages and the help that you get for them is a bit complicated. And this is what uh, we are, uh, the, the book uh, says here that, yeah, the help for the if uh, function is not super helpful, but yeah, at least this is how you can call help in case you need it. Um, right. Uh, okay, here we have an example of a uh, statement, and and then uh, we talk more about uh, conditions. So um, a condition usually evaluates if something is true or false, right? So uh, if it's a vector, uh, we'll get a warning message, uh, and if it's a non uh, existent uh, value, we will get an error. So uh, we should be always aware of these uh, errors that might show up in our code. Uh, we have, for example, here an if statement for a vector that we have true and false. And here we get the error that the condition has a length of uh, more than one. So only the first uh, element uh, will be used. Um, this means that the, um, um, I have to say R will, eva will evaluate only the first element of the vector and it will stop. Uh, it will not check the other, whatever else follows the first, um, yeah, the first element. So in the second case that we have the NA value, we get that missing value where true false is. Okay. Uh, in this case, uh, as we are advised here, we can use the double vertical line. I'm not sure how this is called in English, not even in Greek, to be honest, and or the double uh, end to combine multiple logical expressions. So if when we want to use logical expression, we should use those uh, symbols, the double versions of these symbols, right? Um, if we use uh, in, uh, in, uh, in other operations, for example, we can use only one vertical line to uh, denote or this or this. But when we have logical operations, uh, we should use um, two of them. And yeah, here we are explain the book explains what uh, happens in its case. So when we use uh, those lines here, um, the the code, as long as it sees the first true, it returns true and doesn't check for anything else. And the second thing, uh, the the second in the second case, uh, it returns just false. Sees the first false and returns false. Mm, okay. Uh, right, so here again, it says that, as I said, in normal operations, we usually use the one uh, uh, one vertical line or an end, but these um, these symbols are vectorized when you when you use only one of them. Vectorize it's a bit complicated in the in the sense that, it means that it will check for everything that you have in a vector, for example. And here, as we were, uh, as it said earlier, anyway, uh, in the if we need one only only one output. So in this case, again, uh, we won't get one output because these symbols here will ask will check everything in the vector. I don't know if that was clear. But anyway, just remember that when you use a logical expression, 
logical expressions, remember that you have to use uh, the double vertical lines and the double ends. Uh, again, uh, when testing for equality, also be careful because the double equals, we check if uh, something is the same as, as something else, is again vectorized, which means exactly that if you get more than one output. And, and yeah, so in this case, um, you can um, limit the, the, not limit, but you can collapse, let's say, a vector using functions like all or any. Yeah. Uh, oh, also we are um, not advised, but let's say, that the book points out that we can also use the identical function to, to check uh, for if, if something is the same as something else, which is not vectorized, which should, is good when we are uh, working in if statements. But we should keep in mind that the identical function is very strict. And this means that um, it doesn't coerce types. So what, what course types means that, uh, for example, I don't know uh, if we should have talked about this in the previous chapters that uh, we have loads, numbers that have decimal um, places and uh, integers, uh, numbers that, are, uh, that have no decimals, for example, one and 1.0. So in R and in other programming languages too, uh, integers and load numbers, doubles, uh, it's the, are, are supposed to be different types of values. So when we're using the identical function, uh, it doesn't understand that 1 and 1.0 are the same because they're different types of numbers. So here we have 0L, L denotes uh, integer, and 0. So these obviously are the same, but apparently, according to uh, the identical function, they're not, we get a false. So yeah, we should always keep in mind that this is a very strict function. Uh, and again, yeah, these are some other examples, again, uh, floating point numbers that can be also a bit uh, confusing. Uh, so, um, all right, so now we can move to multiple condi conditions. Um, we can have a chain of multiple if statements. Um, so for example, we can have if something, do that. We can have a code chunk uh, uh, saying what the code will do if this condition is satisfied. Then we can have else if something else, if another condition uh, appears, do that. And then we can have another else for a third, um, in case this condition, the second condition is not satisfied either. Uh, we can do that, but in the end, we should be careful not to overdo it because we might end up with a very uh, complex code. And uh, in this case, we should consider rewriting it. Um, we are also advised to use switch in case that um, um, we have... Uh... All right, so uh, this function, the switch function allow allows us to evaluate selective code based on position or name. So for example, in this case here, we have a function uh, that has two arguments, uh, X and Y, and then we have op operation. So here we have, uh, we tell the function to switch operations. So when we have plus, uh, it should add the two numbers. When we have minus, uh, subtract, times, um, yeah, multiply and divide, divide the numbers. And in the case that we have an unknown operation, it should stop and print unknown operation, 
Oh, no. Oh. Um, right. And um, okay, uh, we can use cut in uh, in case we want to uh, uh, to to discrete to discreticize to uh, cut. Let's say continuous variables in order to make it um, more readable and easy to understand. Uh, so now, well, fraud style, uh, more or less, I have, this, I, I have said some stuff about uh, coding style already, namely about the squiggly or curly brackets, as we call them. And uh, yeah, how to use them with if statements. So both if and function uh, should all, almost always be followed by those curly brackets. Um, and uh, as I have uh, said earlier, uh, both of them should be indented by two spaces uh, because this makes uh, the code easier to uh, to understand and makes the hierarchy of the code also uh, also easier to uh, to understand. Um, yeah, an opening curly brace should never go on its own uh, and uh, should always be followed by a new line. So every time we open a curly bracket, uh, we should a curly brace. We should always go. To uh, to the next line, uh, but a closing curly brace should always go on its own line unless it's followed by else. And in this case, as you see here, for example, in the example code, we have a closing curly brace, else, and then another curly brace. And also, uh, we should never forget to indent the code inside the curly braces, uh, again, to to denote that this code chunk is actually one, one thing. Uh, so here we have a good example that we have if, and then the argument, and then the curly brace and the code. Uh, so if, uh, if Y is indeed, um, let's say like below zero, we will get the Y is negative. And if y equals equals zero, then we will have the log x. And then, so we have a condition, if it's satisfied, uh, we get something, we have another condition and then an else. And at the end, we have the, the curly brace of the, at the end being on its own line. And yeah, then we have a bad example that everything at least uh, coding, uh, I mean, as regards to the style of the code is sort of violated. And we see that it's a bit messy and yeah, it's not a good uh, practice to write like that. Uh, okay, so um, here we also have a note about if else and if else. So these are different things. Uh, for now, we have discussed about uh, if, else, so two different words. But this is a condition, so we have a condition, and then if the condition is not satisfied, something else happens. Uh, whereas the if, else, uh, take some input that we would like to test, and, and, it, give, and it gives an output of um, whatever, of like, if this is the case or not. So here we have yes, no, yes. Uh, because here it checks. Uh, so, in this example. Uh, oh, no, I uh, that's OK. So it's like this is yes, this is no, and this is yes. And uh, here we have, uh, again, we say if else, 
eight and uh we don't have a variable well i think i don't remember exactly what i wanted to show with this example but anyway what i wanted to point out basically is that if else is mainly a, a way to test if something is true or false uh, according to what we want to check every time. But uh, if dot dot else um, is basically a condition. And when we need a conditional, we should always use the if else, the one that we have used here, and not the if else, because it's a different thing. Um, also, instead of the if else one word, we can use the clear uh, function if underscore else, uh, which is uh, better to that can and can help us to catch errors. Um, uh, yeah, easy, more easy, in in an easier way anyway. Uh, if any of the vector characters, so yes, students A. Yes, you're right. So exactly, thank you, Daniel. Uh, exactly checks whether we have eight, and if we don't have eight, it returns an A. And we have a range of numbers from one to uh, ten. And here we can see that yeah, we get eight on the uh, where eight is supposed to be, and any of every other uh, number of the out of the ten, we get the an A. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, takeaway messages from nineteen point four uh, is that uh, the condition must evaluate to true or false uh, as. Uh, and so we should uh, remember that we want one output and we will, and we get actually one output each time. We should be careful with vectorized uh, functions, for example, the equals equals. Um, we should remember to use or and and to combine multiple logical expressions. And uh, yeah, we can string multiple if statements together as we have already demonstrated above with if, else, if, else. Um, we can also use switch when we want to switch from something to else. And we can also use cut to discretize continuous variables and make our code, uh, our if statements shorter. And for the format of the if statements, um, we should remember to follow it always by a current brace and indent the new line that we start the code uh, after the curly brace by two spaces. And uh, we should never forget that the closing uh, curly brace should be on a line on its own, unless it's followed by else. Right, so we can move to the function arguments if there are no questions until now. No questions for me. Okay, great. Uh, None from here. Okay, great. So I'll continue. Uh, in general today, I'm hoping to finish the functions chapter. I, um, I decided not to uh, try to and locate it too much with exercises and stuff like that because we have already been quite uh, slow and we had the problem with the time as well. Uh, so better to try and speed up. But in case we you need any clarification or anything or we have in case we get time at the end, we can take a look at the same. Time. We'll see. Uh, so now moving to uh, function arguments and uh, yeah, we are reminded that the arguments to a function, tuple 
basically fall into two broad sets. One is the data to compute on, and the other supplies the argument that control the details of the computation. For example, um, yeah, for example, here you have log, the data is X, and the details is the base of the logarithm. So in the mean function, the again, uh, inside the parentheses, we will put X, and this would be the data. And the details are how much data to trim from ends and how to handle mis missing values. The important thing is that um, the first uh, argument, I mean, you can have one uh, mandatory argument and the other, the details are optional. You can have them, you can define them or, or not. Um, in the t-test, another function that needs to uh, arguments mandatorily, you have x and y, and details are alternative new paired blah blah blah. Uh, and yes, yeah, so uh, usually as uh, it says here, data arguments should come first. Data arguments are the mandatory one. Ma uh, the mandatory ones and detail arguments uh, are usually at the end and again usually should have default values so in case the user decides not to define them you should have something that uh, when you are the one writing the fun function you should specify a default value uh, so uh, yeah we have an example here and we have function with the data argument is x and confidence interval is uh, 0.95. Uh, so yeah, here, for example, just by um, uh, entering the data uh, argument, we get uh, have to say like we get an output for what we have entered without uh, defining the comp. Right, so uh, the default value that we choose should be all should be the most common value, and uh, this, um, for example, uh, no, uh, th this as it says here, it's better because we expect that most users will use, uh, we will need this value. And th there are a few exceptions. For example, it makes sense as uh, it notes here, the NA remove to be default as false uh, because missing values are important. So we should uh, not, for example, allow for something to have missing values. and this should be a by default to false. Um, so, yeah, it's, as it says, it's usually a bad idea to silently ignore missing values by default, uh, at least in a function. Uh, yeah, and when you call a function, you typically omit the names of the data arguments because they are used so commonly. And if you override the default value of a detail argument, you should use the full name. So for example, here that we have a, an example, we don't, uh, for the data argument, we don't, we don't write X equals one to 10, but we just omit X and we just say one, uh, 10 and, for the data argument, uh, for the sorry, the detail argument, the NA remove, uh, we call it by the full name, NA remove equals true in this case. And then we have some bad examples uh, that we have the data argument called by the full name. And, and then we just don't get anything for the, um, for the detail arg argument, for example. So yeah, this is bad practice, don't do it. Uh, yeah. 
Um, right. So as I said, you, you can refer to an argument by its unique prefix, but it's generally best to be to avoid it in case that uh, it might lead to confusion. And yeah, again, a stylistic uh, note here that uh, when you call a function, you should place a space around the uh, around the equals in function calls, and always a space after a comma, not before. It's like writing in regular English. Um, and again, uh, this is uh, this makes it easier to skim the function for the important component. Uh, and yeah, the, for example, this, this example here, it's very um, crowded and yeah, it's a bit weird looking. Whereas this one is, um, it's better to, to skim through. Now for the names of the arguments. Uh, okay, uh, just try, the, there is a trade-off between having short names and easier to use and having a, um, descriptive names just to know what, what you're using. Um, so you can, for example, remember that X, Y, Z are four vectors. For example, W is a vector of weights, DF is a data frame, I and J are numeric indices, typically rows and columns. N is for length and P is number of columns. So this, it's a good idea to use these whenever you call in a function something that uh, apply that not applies, but something that refers to some some of them. Avoid, for example, uh, calling a data frame uh, not DF but X, for example. This might be confusing. Um, right. Um, okay, in case you don't remember how exactly a, fun a function of yours work, you can easy uh, because uh, it, it might you might have written many functions and you just don't remember how uh, uh, the function what exactly the function does or how does it treat uh, the arguments. And yeah, it, it's good to remember to make explicit constraints. Um, yeah, here we have an example with the function that uh, in the end, X and Y are not the same length. And yeah, we got, uh, we get uh, an answer that is a bit weird. Uh, so it's important, it's a good practice, if not important, to check important preconditions uh, and throw an error, uh, something that warns the user that something is not going uh, as planned. For example, using the previous function here, uh, we can have an if uh, statement inside our function that checks the length. So in case that length of X is not equal to the length of W, uh, stop the function, the, the, yeah, stop the computational process and print X and Y and W must be the same length. Uh, and in this case, you set the precondition. So in case this is, the case that the two uh, data arguments don't have the same length, we should know it in advance and yeah, uh, avoid mistakes um, in the code later. Uh, again, there is a trade-off, so we should always uh, keep in mind that we should avoid spending too much time to um, uh, to try to cover all the possible scenarios that uh, things can go wrong. Uh, but 
uh, at the same time, we should try to make our function robust and not just uh, um, and not be too lazy to have those type of pretests. Uh, for example, in this case, we just added two lines of code and we did something that it was important. So in this case, it's a good idea, but yeah, just try not to overdo it. Um, Right. Okay. Yeah. Here, for example, we have. Uh, I. I mean, this is a long function to just to to stop if um, the uh, if we have. Yeah. If the remove NAs is not logical. Yeah. Uh, we will get an error that, oh, remove uh, uh, NAs must be logical or it must be the length of one and blah, blah, blah. So in this in this case, yeah, we have a very long um, code chunk or no, I'd say no important, no, no good reason, let's say. So again, this is better to be avoided. And so uh, we can also, uh, as a useful compromise, use the built-in stop if not, and which checks its argument and produces a generic message if this is not the case. So instead of creating for its case a specific message, uh, we can use stop if not, and it will just pop an error. Uh, yeah, for example, here. Yes, it's used. Um, we can see how it's used here. We have stop if not is logical NA remove length NA remove equals equals one. And we get an error in here, blah, blah, blah. So we get a more generic error message. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, Daniel, uh, sorry, I just saw your message here. So guys, uh, I mean, I uh, regard, regarding the next chapters, um, my, how to say, my schedule is pretty packed. So for the, for at least for the, until the first time, the first week of July, I won't be available to do any presentations. I mean, even today, I was hoping to be done with it some weeks ago and yeah, I'm already like a bit, yeah. So at least for vectors and the, the other, I, I can take the R Markdown um, chapter, but yeah, not for, uh, I, I don't think that I will manage for next week. I don't know. Um, I guess th that's fine actually, because I'm actually I was actually planning to take the models chapter, um, so I I can take all of that. I think Adami wants to take um, the vectors, so I think we're left with the R markdown. So I, I guess we're fine. Uh, okay, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I saw that you have signed up for models. Models are too interesting for me too. I don't know if I'll be available to do it, but as long as you have signed up already, that's perfect. And but we have vectors and iterations indeed, so. I don't know. Probably it I think, might be. I think I, I think DME has indicated to take that, right? Am I correct, DME? Yes, I have. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Yes. So I'll just okay. put your name down here for vectors okay. and iteration. Then I'll just continue with yeah with um, model basics. That's fine. And I can just yeah. Fantastic. So we can hope just to, to finish at some point. Yep. All right. <laughs> Great. So, yeah. So, uh, this is being said. Uh, shall I continue with the chapter? Okay, with the schedule? Yes, please. Okay, great. Yep, yep. So, yeah, we're good with the, we're done, let's say, with 
how to to stop our functions for doing stuff that we that that are not supposed to do and warn the user and our future self actually that something is not going as planned now uh just a little uh clarification but uh yeah a note let's say here that many functions in R can take an arbitrary number of uh, inputs. And this is denoted by using the three dots in the parentheses. Uh, so for example, here, when we have, when we use a function sum, we can have a, an arbitrary name number of uh, inputs. We can have just two numbers, but we can have like 100 numbers as well. And we will get um, a result. And yeah, this is done by using those three dots. Um, and uh, it's, it's a useful thing because uh, those three dots can be sent on to another function. And uh, this is useful to catch up if, uh, if a function wraps, let's say, another function. So for example, here that we have function whatever, and then we call uh, the string R package and typically the str underscore C. And uh, again, we have three dots, so we can have whatever here and, um, we will separate whatever here, whatever we put here by commons. Um, so when we are calling this function, the function that we created and we call commons, and we have here letters, which is an, um, it is the whatever that we used here. Uh, it's a function, it's another function. Um, and then we have one to 10, we get a series of letters uh, uh, separated by commas. Um, right. The only thing is that any misspelled arguments will not raise an error. So in case that we, because the three dots mean whatever, so these whatever sometimes might be a, a bit uh, too arbitrary and R won't recognize that there is a problem with it. Uh, and the, it makes easy for typos to go unnoticed and ruin our day. Uh, so yeah, okay. So we can also like, if we want to capture the values of the three dots, we can use the list dots uh, another uh, again more of a comment here is that arguments in R are lazily evaluated so if they're not needed they won't be computed uh, it doesn't compute in advance stuff that uh, are not even if something is contained in a function it won't be calculated, evaluated until it is needed to. Uh, so if they're never used, they're never called. Um, uh, so uh, it's, it says, however, that um, it's an important property of R as a programming language, but it is generally not important when we're writing our own functions for data analysis. And yeah, I mean, we are we, whatever if, if you if you want you can read more about it in the uh, yeah in the file here uh so about the return function here um the, we are um right yeah what it says here about return values is why um it's two things that we should keep uh, in mind for returning values from a function is, does returning early make your function easier to, to read? So if 
uh, we get a, an output earlier would be easier for us to read it. And in case we can make our function pipeable, this can be also um, uh, styling wise better sometimes. Uh, so uh, we can use explicit return statements. Um, in this case, the value returned by the function is usually the last statement it evaluates. Uh, but we can choose to return early to have like an early output by using the return function. And um, as it says here, it's better to save the use of return to signal that you can return early, early with a simpler solution, uh, especially when the inputs are empty. So for example, here we have a complicated function that has, that has three arguments and yeah, we have, for example, uh, length of x equals equals zero or length of y equals equals zero. So in this case, just return zero in case that these conditions, any of these conditions actually is fulfilled, then we'll, we'll get an early return, uh, an early output that is zero. And this saves time. If none of them is true, however, we will have a complicated code that will do something else. Um, uh, again, here, uh, when we have the complicated if statements with a complex block and one single block, um, uh, is just to return first the simple case if. Uh, it is not x return something short and then have the, the long condition because otherwise you might forget what was the condition in the first place. Uh, and for pipeable functions, uh, yeah, I don't think that is something very important of this. Uh, so with transformation, an object is passed to the function's first argument and a modified object is returned. And with side effect, the past object is not transformed, but instead the function performs an action on the object. Um, we have uh, taken a look on pipes in the previous uh, chapter. So for example, uh, here we call so missing, uh, and we have a function and we have a data uh, argument that is a DF data frame. And uh, yeah, we have a variable n, which is the sum of the, uh, uh, of the NA values of the data frame. And um, Just missing the point. I think I just removed the example with the pipe. Anyway, the important thing is that sometimes uh, coding wise, it's a bit uh, styling wise, it's a bit better to and more clear to use pipes when you can, um, just to make sure that um, your code is uh, easier to, to read and understand by. Uh, the user. And the last thing uh, of the function chapters is the environment. And as environment, I, I have never actually uh, encountered this before, so it was an interesting thing. Environment in programming can be thought as a collection of objects, functions, variables, etc. And for example, an environment is created when we first fire up R. And any variable we define is actually now in the environment. So, yeah. Uh, and as it says, the top level environment is available to us at the R command prompt. Uh, and, it's call, and it's called R underscore globe M here. Um, so, uh, again, this is not something that we need to understand deeply, especially when we start writing functions. However, um, it's good to have an idea what an environment is. 
and um, yeah, it's good to remember that um, R uses rules called le lexical scoping to find the value associate, associated with the name that is in the environment. And uh, for example, uh, here that we have in this function, the, uh, the X and Y, and Y is not defined within the function, uh, the um, R will look in the environment where the function is defined. Uh, so probably in the R environment somewhere, this Y exists and R will retrieve it from there. Uh, and what else? Yeah, the advantage of this behavior is that uh, from a language standpoint, it allows R to be consistent. So every name is looked up using the same set of rules. Um, right. Uh, yeah, okay. So, as it says here, you can do many things if you can't do it other that, that you can't do in other programming lang languages. Um, but again, uh, you just need to be careful. Um, I have never, I, I mean, I haven't encountered this before. I don't know what type of errors this might cause. Apparently, it can be a bit tricky sometimes according to what it says here, but I don't know. As it says, at, for, at, at least for starters, um, it's okay if you don't worry too much about it. So that's all, at least. <laughs> The, the theory part. Uh, we didn't get to any exercises, but yeah, we're done with function software. So we can ha be happy now. <laughs> and yeah, we're pretty much on time. So I guess we can call it a day. What do you think, guys? All right. Um... I mean, thanks very much. Yeah, I've, I've kind of missed this class quite a bit. I think it's been like almost a month <laughs> since we've done. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> it was the longest class we uh... ever had. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. But I'm, I'm very excited that we actually finished functions. Seems like yes, we have there is progress. Three major chapters to finish, so I think it we're is. almost there. I think I'm almost there. But I mean, thank you, thank you very much for this class. Thank you for the participants. Thank you, thank you I guys think for uh, tuning week. in, and see you next week. No problem. All the best, guys. Bye. All right. Bye bye.